Good day, Klaus. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Good day, Guy. Really nice seeing you again. I mean, we haven't met in person for such a long time. I, I think it was 2012 in Toronto it, would be my guess. Yeah, this might be the last time we met. Mm -hmm. But it's the time I, I, I remember more vividly was when we met, when I did this project together with Roger I. Edison at, at Lowe's. Yes. You know, and then we met close to this lake, which was oh, very nice. That's right. I lived on that lake, uh, Lake Norman. Yeah, just, uh, I remember that. Charlotte, Illinois, yeah, or Charlotte, you, North Carolina. Yes, yes. You still have your boat? I I do have a boat. It's on a different lake. I've moved a couple of times since uh, ah, this okay. been done, but uh, yeah, that was. I I forgot about that, but that that's right yeah. there with him, him working at Lowe's. Um, Ever since I envy you. <laughs> <laughs> I I. I lived, I've, I've been a boating person since I was a child because my father had a boat, but I didn't get my first boat until I was 53 years old. I always rented boats for the summer because I lived in, yeah. in, in the suburbs of Chicago where, where there wasn't, a, a, I couldn't go boating often enough to warrant buying a boat. And Lake Michigan is too rough. It's like an ocean for me. And even yeah. spent time in the Navy, I'm an inland lake boater, not a uh, ocean boater. But uh, but let's start here. So for our audience, would you please introduce yourself? And let's start up with where did you grow up? I grew up in a in a very small town near to Bonn, like the former capital of West Germany. Mm -hmm. And the house of my parents was just locate, located near. Uh, a very small natural reserve, mm -hmm. but this was an incredible playground for us. <laughs> uh huh. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I'm I'm kind of a country boy. Ah, I see. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about the where did you go to study at university and what did you study? Yes, from there because, I mean, after high school, I did not really know what to do. So. A lot of my career is kind of accidental, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but then I decided um, to go to the military first. I spent 12 years in Air Force ah. and during my Air Force time, I studied. So I, I studied in Munich and it was uh, education and political science, which was kind of not at all connected or very little connected with my job in Air Force because I was in missiles and radar. So I had a, a technical job, which I very much enjoyed. But then I thought I study something completely different. Mm -hmm. And this then finally developed into my into the career, career after my military time, because one of my professors advised Siemens, you know, in the leadership development programs. And he took me as an assistant. So this is how I, you know, how I learned about all this stuff. And I found it very attractive. And then, because this was in the 70s, the end of the 70s, you know, this was still Cold War. So I had like 48, 72 hours on duty, and then I had time off. And I could spend this time off in projects at Siemens. They didn't have to pay me and I could learn a lot. <laughs> and this is how it developed, you know. So, and then guys from a, from a consultancy met me there. And then they finally offered me a job in their consulting company. And so I ended up in the consulting business. And finally, I ended up being in senior management in, in one of Germany's biggest consultancies. We had a thousand people. And now I work in our own company, like two small companies. Yes, but you've had your own firms for quite a number of years, true? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's quite a so number. Your, so what was this consulting firm, was, your, was the focus of the consulting firm uh, training and, or education or what, did, uh, what kind of consulting? Yeah, yeah, we do two things. And it's, it's two small companies right now. You know, one is focuses much more on training and anything that is connected to HR. Mm -hmm. And the other one does, you could say, normal organizational consulting. 
mm -hmm. you know, like process re-engineering and um, we look at organizational structures. Uh -huh. And I work in both companies. And I'm not, we, we are small anyhow, you know, most people work in both companies. We use, because I think the training business is quite a good school for consulting also, mm -hmm. you know. You are finally, when, when you get good in training, you are good in working with people in projects, you know, and handling people. This is what you, what you need in consulting also. True, true. So it helps each other. And then when you have consulting experience, your trainings are different also, you know, because you know what you're talking about. It's a different way. <laughs> true. Now, I know you have a, a performance orientation. I don't know exactly how you phrase it. I always call it performance based, but there's a lot of language for that. But uh, let's go back a little bit earlier in your career. And, and, and can you share with us some of the more interesting projects that you worked on? You know, what, what kind of experience did you have as you worked in, a, in somebody else's consulting firm and then in your own firms? What are the kinds of things that you did and can, what can you share with us? Yeah, I mean, I'd say many of the consulting projects are at the same time a little boring and a little interesting because one thing is, <laughs> the interesting part is you can look at it as it's a little bit of detective work, understanding things. And this is what I love about it. You know, it's always a little bit like Sherlock Holmes going in and trying to understand things. Um, and finally, you know, finding new perspectives on it. This is what I like about it. But then if you do this very often, you know, you, you face projects that are alike, although organizations are different, but many of them face very similar projects. And this is then kind of the boring part because what I like less is repeating things. Mm -hmm. so, yes, it's different people, it's a different content, but still the same. So having said this, there is a few projects that I really found interesting. One thing was I worked together with a board during a merger of a Japanese enterprise with a German mid-sized company. This was really interesting because usually consulting projects face on, let's say a very specific problem, you know, and you look at a part of an organization and anything else remains untouched. In this case, I, I was into each and everything basically, you know, it was production, it was accounting because they, they had to speed up to meet international accounting standards and stuff like that, um, it, everything. And in this together with a quite different culture, you know, the company in the say was the Japanese company. Yeah. They, you know, they came in and bought the German one. Um, so this was quite interesting. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an incredibly learning experience especially when it comes to those cultural things, you know, how they operate mm -hmm. in different countries. So I like that. And the other thing is, I think in 2004, was a, I mean, it's quite some time ago, USAID approached ISPI. I, I think everybody knows what ISPI is, right? Or do we have to explain? This? Well, the International Society for Performance Improvement, of which you and I are long-time members and past presidents. and Yes. Um, and USAID thought the methodology that the society stands for, let's say, the, would be helpful in their projects in development work. Mm -hmm. And then they brought around 40 people to Bulgaria and asked ISPI to train those 40 people or to give them a first idea of the methodology. And I was the, let's say, the only European faculty member 
You know, it was all guys like you, Americans, and because Bulgaria was in Europe, they asked me, are you willing to do this? And of course, I thought, yeah, this sounds interesting. And I did it then together with Roger Addison and Roger Chevalier. And this is how USAID, you know, learned about us and met us. And then they sent call for proposals to our company also. This started in Macedonia, and then we thought, okay, this is not exactly our core business. Um, still, this systemic perspective, you know, and how, how do you work with organizations? I thought, let's, let's give it a try. And then we won. And ever since, we built quite a good reputation in this environment. And those projects are much more interesting from my perspective, because they bring us in, you could say, to do an audit of the whole organization. You know, it's not a very limited perspective. You look at everything and then you make recommendations. What could be improved? You know, how could this organization become more efficient or even more effective, depending on what you look at? And I mean, some of the projects were failures. This is, I mean, officially every project is a success story. This is what you know as well as, as I do. But looking behind the scenes, the working in develop, development context, it's incredibly difficult. Um, so I would say yeah, some of the projects were failures, not because we did big mistakes, but because of the environment, you know, things did not go together and you can't control everything. But others were really successful. We did years and years of work in the education system in Macedonia. And this is still something I'm proud of because I think this made a difference for a lot of people, students as well as parents. And we did this together with um, two ladies but one was Vera Kondik Mitkovska. She's a Macedonian and she still works in this context in Macedonia. And the other one, and I think you know her, was Maya Joachim Petkovska. She finally went to World Learning, a company that does development work. And she is a member of ISPI, a long term member now. So she came in contact with those ideas in our projects. And those mm -hmm. two ladies made a huge difference, you know, being coming from the country and we went in and out mm -hmm. but they were there all the time mm -hmm. you know, they ensured that things really took off so I, this is one I really liked and okay. all those projects are incredible learning experiences also because we do not have the subject matter expertise for all the things that they ask from us you know and then we collect an international team of consultants and you learn from them obviously yeah that's one of the beauties of uh, teaming up with other people um, yeah. um is that you get an opportunity to learn from them uh, let, let me shift gears here a little bit uh, i want to explore a little bit your first exposure to what i call hpt human performance technology of course it's known by many different names uh astd atd now uh, calls it um, human performance improvement. Others simply just call it performance improvement or performance technology. Mm. What do you call it? And how did you first come across that? I mean, in the environment of ISPI, I call it performance improvement. Um, otherwise, when we work with customers, we do not even use the term. You know, it's simply like they, they are interested in us helping them to solve a specific problem. And whether we use this performance improvement or any other methodology, this is not what they are really interested in. So therefore mm -hmm. I try to avoid this because it always forces me into, I have to explain what it is then, you know, and this is for some people because this is simply too much. Then they lose interest, you know, because they want to talk about their problem and not about the methodology. 
True. I think that's important for people to understand that we shouldn't be touting the methodology. Clients aren't necessarily interested in how we go about it or what we call it. They're looking for results. Hmm. So, In addition, I think if you put things together, like, like if you put performance improvement, you know, all the stuff that you find there together. And if you look at what, what Gary did with this, you know, looking at huge organizations. So, um, then you finally, the basic principles behind it are something like a meter methodology, you know, and you easily can integrate Six Sigma and other things and work with it. So yeah, therefore we, we simply do not use the term. We, we try to find out what is helpful here and then do it. Okay, so I've, I've heard the story, uh, I think I may have even recorded it when we did our first video like this uh, back, I think it was either in, two th I think it was 2009, but I, I forget the date, I forgot to look it up. But so what, how did you first come across this thing called performance improvement or human performance technology? When and where was this? This, this was purely accidental. Um, in fact, it was triggered from the training side because you know, we worked for big companies in Germany like Bayer and, and Siemens. And, so, and the question became more and more urgent, does this really pay off what we invest here? And then we thought, no, they're asking, they're asking this question internally, but give it some time <laughs> and they will <laughs> ask us. <laughs> and therefore we started, we, we tried to find um, opportunities to learn about this, you know, to, and then I went to an ASTD conference and nowadays ATD, but then it was ASTD. And I booked the pre-conference workshop from the Robinsons. Mm -hmm. This was my first encounter with performance improvement. And I sat there and I thought, okay, this is quite interesting because it talks in a much more precise way about things that you vaguely have in mind, you know, and things you are not content with. And so, so you find something here. I like that. And then I'm an, I'm really, I'm an avid reader. You know, I read and read and read and read. So then I started looking for literature. I ran into Gary's performance improvement, improving performance. Um, and from there, I learned about ISPI, you know, and then I went to ISPI conferences, got a little bit more educated. And then I thought, okay, here, this is much more the real thing. So when you want to learn about it, you should be here and not at ASTD conferences. Well, you could it's, always find the ISPI uh, thought leaders over at ASTD as well, right? I mean, Jim Robinson. Yeah, but then it's, it's kind of scattered all over the place. You know? yes. and if, you don't, if you do not know them, you do not know, you know that they come from ISPI and that they, ha that they share the same home. And, mm -hmm. stuff. So, and the second thing was very helpful for me because I have been, I think for 15 years or something like this, I have been on the board of a of a German association here. And then when I, I went to ISPI, I did a little kind of a trick. You know, I did not simply register for the conference. I contacted the ISPI board as a German board member, you know, contacting the other board. And this opened doors for me immediately. You know, then, I met with the board, they introduced me to other people. Um, yeah, it was like, like snowballing very quickly then, you know, so this is how I met people. And then finally, um, one lady was Claire. Claire Carey. She, yeah, Claire Carey, she was on the board. I do not know for how many years. She introduced me to a lot of people, um, so, so she supported me very much. And then I, I finally met Roger Edison, and this led to, because when we talked, you know, I talked about Gary's book also, and there was one, 
And then he said, yeah, I think the two of you should meet. And what he did then, he was responsible for those pre-conference workshops. Yes. On the conferences. And mm -hmm. then he brought us together in, the, in those workshops. It was then for years, it was uh, Lynn Kearney, Roger Edison, Gary Rumbler, and me teaching those workshops. Yes, the principles and practices. Uh, yes, yes, the principles yes. and practices. So, and therefore then Gary became kind of a central figure for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was- about, You're it, talking about Gary Rumbler, so that the, the audience hasn't heard his last yes. So I thought I'd interject, yes. but uh, yes, yeah, somebody that uh, we both admired. Yeah. So, so who were some of your, so, so you've mentioned the Robinsons, uh, Jim Robinson and Dana Gaines Robinson. You've mentioned uh, Roger Addison, Gary Rumler, Lynn Carney, Claire Carey. Um, so who else are some of the thought leaders, uh, you're an avid reader. Who, so who do you pursue? And what I'm looking for here are potential recommendations for people, books, articles, that yeah. might want to look at uh, if they're interested in pursuing a performance orientation to instruction or just performance improvement, you know, well beyond instruction. I mean, talking about instruction, I certainly read your books. Well, I'm sorry. Which I think, yeah, which, <laughs> you know, times changed. And with all those agile approaches right now, you know, people look for, uh, other ways to doing it, but basically, you know, what is in your books, the content, it, I mean, you still have to do it. If you do it in, in a different way, sure, you get, but you still have to do it. Yeah, so I think this is still a recommendation. Um, what I think is a recommendation also is, is Gilbert's book. Human competence. Human competence. It's I still think for people who come into contact with the field, it's an eye opener. Mm -hmm. It has a little disadvantage because he has those six areas, those six boxes, you yes, know, that, yes. how he looks at things. So the behavior engineering model. Yeah, he, he does not take a systemic approach. You know, one of the principles in, I, in ISPI is now take a systemic approach. This is what he does not do. But, but one simply has to see, this is a book that is probably 30 years old. You know, it triggered something in the field and many of the things you read about there are still eye-opening. So I, I, even now I would recommend it mm -hmm. to read. Then it's, of course, it's Gary Rumler's books. Yes. This is, I consider this, it's kind of a Bible for me. Um, I do not know how often I have looked into those books. Um, this is really, especially the first one, this was kind of an interesting partnership because the second book he wrote is good because it takes an interesting perspective. You know, he, and when the book had, um, Serious performance consulting, according yes. to Rumbler, mm -hmm. he describes a project, and then he he steps out of the project and takes a helicopter perspective and says, "Why did we do this exactly?" So, this is quite nice, and I think for most people, this is a much easier read mm -hmm. than the first book. Mm -hmm. Although I think the first book is incredibly well written, and the partnership of of Gary together with Alan Brage, yes was quite a good one there because the content is scary. The writing is to a large extent, <laughs> Alan Bray. He Alan was Bray. extremely good in writing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yes, this is a, this is a must read. Mm -hmm. One has to have in mind it's, I mean, because it, it takes you, it zooms out to a whole organization. You know, if you start, coming from a training business and looking at people, it takes you into a whole other world. So, but I still think it's from broadening the perspective, it's quite helpful. Even if you might be in a position that you say, I never ever can do this. You know, in my position, I'm much more limited. 
Mm -hmm. But you get a much better understanding how those things integrate and how you can talk to C-suite guy, uh, guys. Mm -hmm. So yes. no, those are yeah. uh, those are uh, fabulous resources. Uh, and I think your comment about Gilbert is, is something similar to what I heard uh, from Rumler is that Gilbert tended to look at individual performance and didn't look at uh, yeah. the dynamics of organizational performance as well. So the behavior engineering model, the six bottle, six boxes model, you can use that to look at organizations, but Gilbert didn't seem to do that as much. And so that was, because I had once asked uh, Gary if he was going to, you know, write his version of human competence. And he, and he always joked that he was going to create a comic book to do, yeah. but, but, uh, but he didn't. But anyway, let me move on here. So, so, um, if, if you were to give a 30 second elevator speech uh, as, as a way of giving an example to our audience, if you're at a neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor doesn't know you and you're introduced and they ask you, Klaus, what do you do? How would you answer them? Yeah, this is a, a good question. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing that I can't spont spontaneously answer that quickly. Um, but I think, meanwhile, we, the difficulty to answer it for me right now is we are in a process of reinventing the company. And this has to do with digitization but it also has to do with COVID-19, okay. you know, because people don't want you to come on site anymore. And so we have to turn things upside down. And it turns around because we are one, we are two small companies. One is a training company, one is the consulting company. So it all turns around. Meanwhile, I would say, we integrate those two perspectives you know, when we are more on the training side, we still integrate the consulting perspective. And this um, changes the way one trains also. And I already said, like, training is a good school for consultants also. So this mm -hmm. is one thing as if you think of unique selling positions. So, mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is what we did is, this is more on the training side now. We developed, you could say, we sometimes call it improvement environments and sometimes development environments. But this has more to do with the customers, with the wording the customers use. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, we move away from doing trainings and setting up those environments um, that ensure that specific objectives are met. And, you know, there we are integrating all kinds of technology also. Um, but the thing is, yeah, it, it put us on a path that we do not know yet where it will end, but it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting. And what it is, is like in many cases, um, I do not know if you say this in English. In Germany, there is, it, you say it like you run through open doors. You know, when you talk to clients and they, because they know if you do a two day training, the percentage of what finally is transferred and what people is minimal, <laughs> you know, in some cases. Yeah. And this is what I mean with open doors. Once you start talking about this and said, now don't think of training. Think of designing an environment where, where training might be a part of it, you know, but many things going together that finally ensure that people do something. And while they are doing it, they get support. And then you finally can see, okay, this changed something and we see a result already. But this is quite interesting. I like that mm -hmm. because it's something new again we most probably are not the only ones that think that way, you know, but for us, it's really, it's, yeah, it puts the company upside down. Well, let me shift gears again here. 
Um, as a lifelong learner, as an avid reader, can you share with us what your current or next focus is for your own learning, for your own development? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing is, this is nothing new. There are some things I go back to many times. For example, I do not know if you ever ran into it, Sturman's book, Business Dynamics. I've heard of that, but I, I'm not familiar with it myself. Yeah, this so. is an incredibly good book. Comes out of uh, MIT. Um, decades of experience also like with Gary's book. Mm -hmm. um, and so when, when it comes to systemic thinking in a, that takes kind of a technological approach, you know, you find it, you can model those systems. There's even software that allows you to run scenarios. You know, you can model a system and then you can make it run for 15 years to see what is happening there. <laughs> So it's what, and I go back and back to those things because this is so essential, you know, and sometimes I even go back, although I, I know this by heart, but I, sometimes I even go back to Gary's book, you know, and look at it again, because you always detect something that you say, okay, yeah, you forget about, forgot about this. This is very mm -hmm. clearly outlined. This is how you, how you should think about it. Um, so th those are more, you could say, like standards. And the other thing is, because we changed so much in the company, we made a decision some years ago to stay small, like being a mixture of a think tank and a consulting company. Okay. Right now, because when you, when you go with those um, digital ideas, you know, then all of a sudden you end up in a situation that things are scaling, are scalable in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. So what I do now is, and this is personal development for me also, you know, I try to understand those scalability things, you know, and how do you run a company differently when you think that way? Um, yeah. I think those are the things that I'm I'm into right now. And this is probably true. Then finally, when we understand it better, based on our experience also, I mean, this will be true for many, for many companies, you know, since if you look at what, what happens in digitization, mm -hmm. the only thing is we are very small, you know, then we have a specific perspective that might be helpful for other small companies. Because what I see here in, in Germany, certainly we are not the only ones, but with some things we do, I think we are quite leading edge, you know? So we are part of the, the small percentage that comes up with innovative ideas that hopefully will finally work, <laughs> but you never know. Right. I mean, there's so many variables. It's, it's, you know, you just can't plug and play things. Uh, not everything's going to work in every context, but uh, uh, that's part of what makes this uh, fun is to deal with all those variables and to experiment a little bit. But uh, again, let me shift gears here again. I, so my question is, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And I want to let the audience know that that and you uh, that I offer this because, as Joe Harless used to complain, the late Joe Harless used to complain way back in the '80s, our language is a mess, and there are there are phrases and terms that are used and misused and misconstrued, and so I want to give you an opportunity to um, uh, cl clarify your thoughts on our language. Uh, define a term uh, that you, that you feel is important for the field to understand, or to address uh, the, uh, terms that and phrases that are being misused and misconstrued. So, do you, do you have a, a term or a phrase that you'd like to tackle? Yeah, I'm not sure because I'm 
I'm not sure if it's misused, but I think it's misleading because okay. we always talk about technology. Yes. You know, and if somebody is not familiar with the field, it's extremely misleading. Um, so therefore, I try to avoid it, you know, unless you talk to insiders. But otherwise, I think it's not really helpful. So, you, so the, the word technology, are you referring to the fact that most people think of technology in terms of computer technology versus yes. application of science? Yeah. It's all those kinds of associations that they develop. And then yes. you end up being in a situation again where you have to explain it. Mm -hmm. You know, and those are, I think, yes, you have to do it then, but it's kind of detours in the conversation. <laughs> yeah. you know, this is not well, what I, it should be about. Well, and, and I think that's the whole issue with human performance technology, as we were discussing before we hit the record button. Uh, as I've been, I've been struggling with this because I like the term technology when it means the application of science. And if it's human performance technology, mm -hmm. the application of science for performance improvement, human performance improvement. And uh, some people talk, say, take the H out uh, as uh, uh, Danny Langdon often uh, uh, suggested that we get the H out. Uh, which was a joke, but uh, he was serious about it. But Don Toasty said that all performance is a human endeavor. And he stopped the discussion that was going on back in 2002 and 2003 about the name. Should we continue to call it HPT, Human Performance Technology, when ASTD was calling it Human Performance Improvement? Yeah. That seemed to resonate better with the audience. And, and I always thought that... Uh, Gary Rummler wrote an article back in 1983 in the Performance uh, and Instruction Journal, an SPI's journal back then in 83, and he had suggested that rather than try to define the professional content of NSPI, the National Society for Performance and Instruction at the time, rather than try to, to define it with a couple of paragraphs, he suggested that we define it in terms of the technology domains. And what, of course, he meant is that there is a science of motivation, there's a science of learning, there's a science of uh, various aspects, and it would allow us to be a big tent organization embracing many means uh, to the ends of performance improvement. Um, and so I, I agree that the, the word technology is an issue that gets a lot of hang up. But I think that if we had, uh, if the organization ISPI had uh, done a more consistent job about defining what they meant by the term, it would have less of an issue. But still, newcomers coming in, they'd be confused and think it was all about hardware and software or something like that. Uh, it has- I mean, the, the thinking that you just outlined, like mm -hmm. it being an evidence-based approach, mm -hmm. you know, I think, the thinking behind it is quite correct. Yes. You know, and it lends itself to using an, 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 a term like technology. Mm -hmm. Still, people who do not know it yet always are kind of irritated. Uh, what we what need is we needed an Alan Brache who could market it better. It's like the engineers can't, you know, salespeople don't like to take the, the sales engineers with them because the engineers will go deep into the uh, details of the technology when the salesperson is just simply trying yeah. to tell the benefit and not what all the details of what it is. But, uh, you know, maybe we're too in love with our own uh, technologies, uh, applications of science. Yeah, I don't know. I, I remember, you know, when you were president, you organized this think tank. Yes. And we had long it was because of Rumler's this. article. It was yeah. because of that 1983 yeah. article. I was so frustrated with the fact that we weren't yeah. getting much traction. And the thought leaders, such as Rumler and Harless and Mager and Brethauer and Kaufman and Edison and dozens and dozens and dozens of more, um, they were a bit frustrated with the organization because we weren't we weren't as well known as Six Sigma. I mean, Six Sigma came out of nowhere and did an end run around all of HPT. And, you know, thanks to uh, Jack Welsh and GE embracing Six Sigma and touting it, it became well known. Well, darn few people realized that when Motorola created Six Sigma, that they licensed Gary Rumler's intellectual property to create Six Sigma. 
So at the root of Six Sigma is this performance orientation. And, you know, and the funny thing is when I talk with people about this is that if you look at the work, a lot of the work that Geary did would be referred to as lean. He wasn't mm -hmm. Six Sigma, he was doing streamlining. He was stripping out all the unnecessary yeah. steps and handoffs and uh, um, doing those kinds of things at Motorola back in the early eighties. Uh, when I left Motorola, I left probably a half dozen projects that I was working on with Gary Rumler. He was my consultant, which meant that I carried his name mm -hmm. around. And Alan Ramis took my position and over, he took over all of my projects with Gary. And, uh, and Alan has told a few stories that are recorded on video about some of the work that they were doing. And they were really doing a lot of streamlining kinds of things, a lot of the, the lean efforts, if you will. Uh, yeah. But they I mean, this is one of the reasons also that when I said I'd like to think of it as a meta meta methodology, like it can integrate all those things so yes. easily. Um, yes, because it's at the roots of it. Well, I, I used to ask people at conferences whether Six Sigma was part of HPT or not, and I would have half the people tell me yes and half the people tell me no, which which uh, indicated to me that we weren't marketing it very well, and I was. I'm, I was of the perspective that Six Sigma, Lean, uh, OD work, motivation work, that's all part of HPT, just as the thought leaders of NSPI back in the mid 60s, I think Gary used to explain it to me this way, they realized that, that doing a stellar job at instruction, training, education, learning, whatever you wanna call it, that wasn't sufficient. And when mm -hmm. they realized that, they began to look beyond uh, programmed instruction, trying to have a bigger impact to the performance of organizations. And they began to look at all of these variables, all the other variables. And uh, you know, everybody ended up with their different approaches and different models and different languages, the Magers, the Harlesses, the, the Rumblers. Um, but the, it, was, it was exciting for me, I just, I just ate it all up. I just absorbed it as, as mm. I could, and I apologize to everyone. It's all the mistakes that I've made with it. But uh, I can see the like there is a historical issue behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the start at the society, and then they understood. Even if you look at at people, you know, it's not simply knowledge and skills. And you broaden the perspective, but you broaden the perspective around people. And then you have humans performance. You know, at this point in time, it perfectly makes sense. Now, what you just described, then once guys like Rumler started to take an even broader view, and you look at not only at the environment of people, you look at organization, then you end up with those things what Gary always said is like, uh, put a good man into a bad system and the system wins almost any time. Yes. But that's, there is still, this is still like the history of NSPI, you know, because it's a person in the system. Now, at the very same time, or already in the 50s, Deming wrote 70 to 80% of problems organizations face are not connected to people. And then he up to ninety four percent. I mean, yeah. even you know, no matter what the percentage is, the percentage with people is big enough. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. to do. But then, you know, yes, and I'm still convinced that this is correct. There are things in an organization that you can touch and improve without touching people at all. You know, if you redesign a process, mm -hmm. sometimes you can even do it, and people do not even have to learn anything. Right. They simply stop doing certain things. So like you said, like, like the streamlining thing. Once you are there, then human performance technology omits part of what can be done. You know, it's it then it the term falls short of what is the power of this whole approach. So I can that's see been, that's been the okay. argument about why taking the H out is because it suggests that it's all about the human component. Yes. And um, so maybe Don Toasty, the late Don Toasty uh, did it as a service, but uh, 
but he was, you know, his position, as I remember, I remember vividly him, everybody was arguing about, you know, whether we should leave, what should we do with the name? And there's a legacy issue and, you know, all the acronyms that the society uses and all that. Um, but, uh, but so yeah, Deming comes at this from quality control, quality assurance, and then broadening from there. You know, if you're doing inspection at the end of the production cycle and looking at the product to determine, you know, what is what is garbage, what is yield, what needs to go be reworked or thrown back, um, and the NSPI crowd come at it from an individual human and then a team kind of an approach. It's the blending of all of that that I think is where the most power is because you might see that you don't have to address knowledge and skills you just maybe need mm -hmm. to change the process and maybe that's with equipment and machinery and less to do with the human or that the train the retraining that people need is minor compared to the leverage that you got by changing some of the other variables in the performance mm -hmm. um, but it's it's been a challenge for the organization but what i wanted to, wanted to capture here before we before we wrap this up is um, you've worked with some very interesting people and heroes to many of us. And some of those people are still with us and some of those people are no longer with us. But can you take some time with us right now to share with us some stories about some people? And I'm gonna ask specifically for Rumler because I know you, you have worked with him You've done things with them, and uh, whether it's a story that has uh, a, a, a technology, uh, an application of science, a HPT kind of a thing, or just something that humanizes Gary, what are some of your favorite stories? If you're sitting in the bar and having a drink with people, and somebody asks you to tell a story about Gary Rumler, what story would you default to? Can the story involve me? Yes, certainly. Okay, then, I mean, I think what find it, what connected Gary and me was a similar thinking about one issue, because I have been teaching, I do not know how much during my life, you know, in all kinds of settings. And he did also, but neither he nor me considered himself to be a teacher, I think. We both considered each other to be learners. And what I liked the most when I visited in, in Tucson, mm -hmm. before breakfast, we took walks into the desert. This was simply freewheeling, thinking and talking. And I mean, Gary and I politically were quite far apart. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. But during those walks, it was always about, and th those were the only occasions also when we talked politics, but it was always like trying to understand the other one. And I said, why does he think that way? Mm hmm. And it was always a genuine interest. And this is what I loved so much about it. And this, I think, made him so accessible also. You know, when, when he did those pre-conference workshops or whatever, you know, and he was always accessible. He talked to me. And um, I think one of the reasons behind it was that he always had something like, I learned from those guys. Yeah. Although they approach me with a question and expect an answer from me. But in those conversations, I also learn. And this is what I loved so much about him. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that resonates with me too. He was very much like that. All right, let's shift over to, to uh, Roger Addison. That, what have you got on him? He's alive, so be careful what kind of stories you tell. <laughs> um, um, so what, what, are, what, what, what kinds of experiences have you had with Roger and what, uh, what can you share with us? There's two things. 
beyond personal things, we might come back to personal ones or other. Two things I, ad I admire him for. One thing is he's, he was somebody who connected people, you know, and th this time I'm not only talking about me. I mean, he connected so many people uh, and was helpful to so many people in that respect. That is really, this is an enormous strength of him. And he tried to do the same thing when he developed his uh, performance improvement landscape. Mm -hmm. You know, he tried to take all those different approaches that to a large extent us were simply marketing variations. Yes, true. You know, of the same yes. basic principles. And I try, he tried to come down to those basic principles and said, look, if we look at that, then we can bring all those things back together. And I think he never was content with it. And I think he still isn't. Um, but I think this was a big service to the community, what, what he did there. Mm -hmm. So, and I, the, I spent 10 years there. He spent 10 years on the ISBI staff, and, and I think that mm. he was he, he was somebody who connected new people coming into the organization with, you know, he'd get, he'd try to understand what, what they were interested in, and he would he would search out people in the society to connect them with. And I when you said that, I just that I flashed on remembering him doing that in front of me with somebody else. He said, Oh, you should talk to so and so. No. Just standing there in the in the hallways at a conference, um, yeah. So, what what personally do you would, would you share concerning Roger? Oh, anybody, anybody. <laughs> this is really difficult because I'm, you know. I was so fortunate being introduced to each and everybody, basically, you know, so right. I, yeah. I was really fortunate to meet all those guys. Um, maybe one last one to mention is the late Roger Kaufman, because he just yes. passed away. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes it was annoying because he pondered the same thing over and over again, year after year, decade after decade. And at the beginning, nobody bought into it. Or it's not that nobody bought into it, but I think we were convinced like, we, our customers don't buy into it. You know, this is not how our customers think. So we can't do this, but he, you know, he pushed his uh, his mega idea, and that whatever one does should contribute to the to the well being of, let's say, the bigger system, the society. Also, so he was very consequent in doing this, mm -hmm. um, and I think he had a. And he was also very accessible, and he had a nice way of doing it. You know, but he was so very strict. This is what I meant when I said sometimes annoying because, <laughs> you know, in certain situations when he came in, you already knew what was going to come. <laughs> <It was like laughs> but he was right, you know. He always said, okay, you guys, there is a gap in, in your thinking. Think bigger, consider this. Yeah, the whole area of social responsibility and mega, um, perhaps now many, not all, of course, will will take that more seriously and begin to look mm -hmm. at what value add our, is our contribution to society, to the planet, to the world, and, and, and as a whole. Um, yeah, he he was he was stuck on certain things. I have to tell this little story now about him. Uh, uh, two weeks before he passed away, he reviewed my latest book and I had sent it out. He gave me, I don't know, six, seven pages of feedback the next day. He had gotten this book. He had stopped everything, yeah. told me, and he read it and he gave me his feedback. And of course, there were certain things he didn't like about what I wrote. And he said, we'll address that later. 
So now I'll have to <clears throat> wait a long time, very forever, uh, to get his feedback. But I very much appreciated him. It was that was one of the the you said you know, about his accessibility and Gary's. Everybody was even the grumpy gr gruff people were accessible. Uh, Joe Harless would bark at people initially, and then he'd say, "So what do you really want?" You know, he would, he might say, you know, uh, about Joe, he'd say, you know, do you have any money? And then he'd say, so no, what do you really want? And, uh, but I, I found the people in that, in that professional home in NSPI, now ISPI, to be so open and to share so willingly, much like Gary. And I, I remember Bill Wigginhorn of Motorola making some comment about, uh, and maybe it was Alan Ramos who made this comment about the work that Gary did, he was so free in giving it away because he had already changed it in his head. So what he gave you wasn't his last effort. It was a stepping stone along his yeah. journey. And uh, so he never felt like he had to, to hold it and protect it and to keep it. He was always about giving it away. And I think that was, uh, um, that was a very valuable lesson for me, and I and I think for many others, I've heard others talk about this how how that society so freely gave away. So it's this whole show your work issue that's going on now about you know let's let's share what we do, how we do things, and help others come along and not be so protective about it. And I like that. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, in this sense, ISBI conferences were always great places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was less marketing teas selling efforts there was some of that but it was more about sharing and uh and it was when you know the 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 thought leaders like uh harless and rumler used to argue and fight i mean the best time at every conference was after dinner in the bar listening to those people argue and debate each other and i think i learned more I, I never took notes. I probably should have, and I wish I would have recorded some of the the back and forth going on because they would they would sometimes challenge each other and playing the devil's advocate most of the time because they were all in agreement because they were all their differences were marketing differences, surface differences, and, yeah. and root all the principles and their practices were were pretty much the same. Klaus, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to do this video interview with me, and I have one final request. Can you share with us any parting words of wisdom for our audience, uh, particularly those people who are fairly new to the field of instructional design or performance improvement? What, what would you suggest to new people coming into the field? Let me give you two answers. Please. One answer is a more direct one to your question, which I usually do not answer because um, this is not a joke now. Because I, I really think I'm not somebody to give advice um, in such a sense. So, because I think learning is something very personal. But, but otherwise, I would say then I would say yeah start with the classics read gilbert first because it's a smaller step you know and then read rumbler and then and then read kaufman look at harless material you know you it finally it, it comes all to yeah read the classic ones this is one thing the other thing is and this goes back to one of my professors you know when i was very young behind human performance finally is a person which means we are talking about personal development, also of personal development of people coming new into the field. And I think what, what this professor tried to teach us as young guys was that he said, the straight path to personal development is the detour. It's all about finding things that you did not look for. So this is not really kind of an advice, but it's kind of, I'm very convinced, meanwhile, now being <laughs> much older than when he told us, 
but I'm very convinced that this is true. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, if somebody likes that, approach things in such a way. Don't be too target oriented. You know, when you do the job, the methodology, yes, this is results oriented. This is one thing. But when it comes to your own development and to learning, then it's more about detours. I like that. I like that. Klaus, thank you so much for doing this video with me. Uh, uh, have a great day and a, 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 a great life going forward. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it very much. And I hope we have the chance to meet in person again once this whole COVID stuff is over. I hope so too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank bye you bye. very much. Bye-bye, yeah.